Well, good morning. You got me there? Am I on? I didn't know if I turned it on or not, so, yeah. You know, as Jeff, uh, Jeff alluded to it, uh, just stay there for a second, Josh. Um, you know, it's not, uh, I don't think we can uh, just pass over the fact of what happened in Florida this week, and we have to, I think it's important for us to stop and uh, to, to at least spend a little time there. Um, if you haven't heard, there were uh, a former student uh, went to a school in Parkland, Florida, uh, shot some uh, students outside and then went on inside and uh, shot more students inside. Um, killed 17. Uh, you want to put the, is that are we ready to go there? There you go. The 17 student are, are students and administrators. There's one one missing there. Obviously, I don't. They probably didn't miss that. I'd picture or whatever. These are the individuals that were were uh, killed this week. That didn't didn't go home. Up there, you've got. Uh, You've got coaches. You've got one one gal that was going to be a lawyer. Another another young man that was going to be a that was going to go on scholarship to swim at University of Indianapolis. You have uh, uh, athletes, academic stars, security specialists. One kid played in the band. Just let's. I want to just make this a uh, little bit more real today. Not trying to scare us at all, but if you work in the school directly as a teacher and administrator, please stand. Okay. And if you're a student in in uh, high school, please stand. Okay. That's 12. We're still missing five. Can you imagine if these folks, there you go, there's 13. Can you imagine if we lost this many people out of our, out of, not only out of our, our family here, but out of our community? Can you imagine what kind of an impact that would have on a community? And I say that because I want us to understand the reality of what happened because it's it, because it's a, a thousand miles away, you know, you can say, man, that was a bad thing. But I want us to understand what the impact can have. Now, granted, it was a larger city and so on. But the fact of the matter is, 17 people that lost their lives. Thanks, you can have a seat. Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Cruz was a troubled young man. He had lost his father few years back, lost his mother about around Thanksgiving, moved in with some friends, had some mental health issues. I'm sure probably, you know, he, he was expelled from school from basically being mean and, and so on. And we could sit there and say, wow, I, I'm, I'm sure glad they expelled him from school. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? Um, he probably needed to be expelled from school, but he needed help. He needed help. Now, obviously, they're going back now and they're analyzing all the Facebook posts and everything where he's posting with a gun and everything else and so on. And that's all, you know what? As they say, hindsight's 2020, right?
You know, it says that the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 19, says this. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. What is it lifting up a standard against? Well, we can see that in the book of 2 Timothy because it talks about the perilous times and perilous men. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Um, I'm not here just to, just, uh, I'm not a doomsday person that says we're in the last days. Well, you know what? If you consider where we're at, yeah, we're in the last days from that standpoint. And what does it say is going to happen in the last days? Well, it's going to, it says all those things. It says it, it, it's going to be, I think my, uh, the, the heading on here, it, on my chapter three here, is, says perilous times and perilous men. We are in perilous times. But we also know that God raises up a standard. Well, what is, does it mean when it says God raises up a standard? Well, when, when, when armies went to battle in, in Bible times, they would lift up a big banner, and that's when everybody knew to come to battle. That's what everybody knew. They carry this banner, this uh, this standard, if you will. They carry this standard into the fight. Everybody rallied around that standard. You know, it's interesting because when we think of that passage, when we think of it, that it says uh, he, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. Well, okay. So what that means is that He raises up a banner and says it's time to fight. It's time to go to war. And we know that our battle's not against flesh and blood, but it's principal princes, powers of the air, and so on. So what we're, that passage is talking about is raising up a standard that says, okay, people of God, it's time to come to battle. I'm concerned that the body of Christ has lost their fight. Inside of them. At our elders meeting this week, we spent some time talking about that and talking about how we have to be ones that that carry the voice of Christ. That that you know are seeking to really truly make a difference not just sitting there you know so many it, it seems as though there are a lot of people satisfied with fire insurance you know what I mean they're satisfied with oh, I'm, I, I, I've got my salvation now I know I'm not going to hell but the problem is is that is only part of the purposes of Christ. Yeah, he came to save us, but he came to show us how to live. You know, there's a lot of voices. There's a lot of voices. I mean, even we, we, we heard with this situation this week, uh, I heard one, one of the students finally say, just say it publicly, stop using this for political gain. Because everybody's trying to be a voice. Well, if we've done this or if we've done that or, or this or that or the other thing, stop using this for political gain. But there are so many voices. You got 
media, you got Facebook, you got posts and Twitter up, Twitter opinions. And you know, when I when Googled Parkland shooting, I got almost three million possible articles, opinions, and posts. Three million. Everybody's got something to say. There's all kinds of voices out there. And the problem is, is that all the voices are drowning out the one voice that needs to be heard. And see, the challenge to us is, do we, first of all, do we run to all the posts and everything else? Are we so hooked on the social media and everything like that, that it's actually in our hearts and minds, it's drowning out the one voice, the one thing. Secondly, is the voice being heard? Our voice. The one voice that should be proclaiming the way to live. Should be proclaiming. It should be hopefully helping guys like Nicholas Cruz. We can really vilify him, can't we? And I mean, what he did was wrong. No doubt about it. It's a terrible thing. But my heart hurts just as much for him as it does for all those other kids and families that are affected. This week I was thinking about John the Baptist a bit. Now when you think of John the Baptist, John the Baptist was really over the top kind of guy. I mean, he come out of the wilderness and he, he's wearing these, this, he, he's, he's, he's wearing uh, uh, camel's hair and he's got this leather girdle on and, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now it's over the top, right? Yet he was well known in his day and thousands were drawn to him and here he's preaching and he was baptizing them with water. To many, he was kind of the one thing of his day. But he didn't let his popularity go to his head, and he remained humble and preached that someone greater was coming, speaking of Jesus. And here's what it says in, in Matthew 3. It says that, uh, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, it's interesting because back then, a master would come home from, from being out and his servant would unstrap his sandals and wash his feet. That's where we get the whole thing of feet washing and everything like that. And John the Baptist says, I mean, he's this great, great guy. I mean, he's got his own, I mean, you know, he's a rock star, so to speak. And he says, somebody's coming that is, I can't even be a servant to. I am, I, am, I am too low to be a servant to. I can't even unstrap his sandals. I can't wash his feet. It's just he's so far above that. And basically what John the Baptist was saying is he's the one thing. He is the only thing. He said he was un unworthy to do the lowest task for Jesus. He was saying that there's someone coming who's really the one thing and he's far above me. Then you have this dialogue between, I mean, they got, they're trying to figure out what, who this John the Baptist was and, and, and they, they have this dialogue uh, uh, with John the Baptist, all these the people the Pharisees sent, and they said, are you the Messiah? John the Baptist says, no. He says, well, are you Elijah? Answer, and his answer was, I'm not. And this is the book of John, chapter 1. Are you a prophet? Nope. Nope, I'm not that. Well, the last question is, well, who are you then? He says, I'm a voice. That's all I am is a voice. I'm not these guys. I'm not these big, big wigs that you're talking about, these, these famous historical figures and so on. I'm not any of that. He said, I'm a voice. I'm a voice that's come out of the wilderness like was prophesied would. I'm just a voice. 
You see, in a time when we're hearing all kinds of other voices, maybe we as Christ followers need to be more like John the Baptist. We're called to be a voice. We're called to be a voice. The rest of the verse in John 1 talks about I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was to prepare the way of the Lord. You know, I looked up the definition of wilderness, and it means a wild and uncultivated region. Uninhabited or only inhabited by wild animals or wasteland. You know, that's kind of how I feel about today's society. kind of a wasteland anymore it seems like now I don't say that as a downer I don't say that in a bad way but what we're missing is the clear voice we're missing the clear sound there's a passage I believe in I think it's in the first Corinthians if I'm not mistaken unless the trumpet makes a clear sound who's going to run to battle Are we making a clear sound? What I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to spend a few minutes. I'd like us to break up into some prayer groups here. Now, if you're you're a visitor here today or you're uncomfortable praying out loud, you don't have to pray out loud. There's plenty of people that will pray out loud. Just, Just join them. Don't feel bad about not praying out loud or anything, but just join them. And and what I'd like you to pray about this morning, just first of all, pray for the families that are in deep grief. You know, Psalm 34, 8, I don't know if I got it up there or not. Yeah. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Let's pray for the families that are in deep grief. Let's pray for the churches and Christ followers there to be the hands and feet of Christ. Let's pray for the teachers and administrators in that school system and pray for all Christ followers to be bold, to be a voice. We're going to take a few minutes to do that. Just gather people around you. And like I said, don't just, just, join, just join a group and don't feel like you have to pray out loud. But we, I, I think it's important that we spend some time. this morning that as you raise as you raise up that standard that you call your people for battle father we know that the last word has not been spoken lord you are the final word father we just want to pray lord god not only for these families for this young man father we ask that Lord God, that you bring comfort to the families. Father, as only you can do. Father, will we ask you, Lord God, to touch this young man's life as well. Father, you have historically, Lord God, you've been a God that takes that takes ashes and you make something beautiful out of it. Lord, we say, do it again. Do it again. Make something beautiful in only the way that you can out of the ashes of this situation. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been in this series, and I'm just going to share a little bit this morning. We've been in this series called One Thing. 
we've been focusing in the past couple Sundays, we focused on Mary and Martha, and Mary chose to sit at Jesus' feet, whereas our, at Martha got frustrated because she was doing and doing and doing. And Jesus said, only one thing is needed. Only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen it. Doesn't mean that serving was wrong, but it meant that Jesus was saying, this is the one thing, this is the most important thing, is to sit at my feet. Hopefully you've begun to realize what that is about. Meaning spending time with him is crucial, it's, it's vital for the life of who we are. It's an area of our lives that we have to continually keep in check. We have to make sure that we're keeping it a priority, don't we? I don't know if there's anybody that ever, that at one time or another in their life hasn't struggled with sitting at Jesus' feet, so to speak. However, today I want us to take the next, I want us to take us to the next place because uh, once the one thing is in place, it should motivate us to other things. I want to show you something in this passage in Matthew chapter 1. Verse 35 to 38, it says, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. So he went, the first thing he did is before, before daybreak, he went and spent some time with Jesus. That's what he did. That's what he did. That's, that was, I mean, I'm sure this was, this was the, the normal thing for Jesus to do. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, Everyone's looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. Do you find that kind of interesting, interesting response to the disciples? The disciples say, everybody's looking for you. Where have you been? You know, it's kind of like, where have you been? And immediately Jesus says, we must go to other towns as well, and I will preach them too. to them too. That's why I came. In other words, what happened out of that dialogue is that Jesus, from being with his father, there was something that he had to do. I mean, I, I, can, I can just hear this, uh, this conversation, if you will, between him and the Father and, and giving him his, his, his order, his marching instructions, so to speak. You see, that's what's supposed to come out of our time together with him as well, too, is that we're provoked to action. You see, the problem is, is that so often what we do is we sit back and we say, okay, now I've got my time with God in today. I got marked that off my list, and let's go get there. Let's go to my job, and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, is that out of that time at Jesus' feet should come some action. It should come some action. Well, he didn't sit around. He didn't sit around, did he? His time with the Father helped him know where to spend his time. Jesus went to be with his Father, the one thing, and out of that, he knew what to do next. And let me just put it this way. The being led to doing. The being led to doing. And often we have a disconnect there. Oh, it's easier to be, but then what about the doing part? I'm not sure about the doing part. Some believers, again, seem, seem to think... They seem to be content with sitting around spiritually thinking all that they need to do is accept Jesus and that's it. But we're not called to a life of passivity, but rather a life of passion. That's, you know, I hope we understand the difference there. We're not called to a life of, of passivity. We're not called to be passive. What we're called to is to be passionate in our relationship with Christ. John the Baptist was passionate. He identified Jesus as Christ. And he pointed others to him as well. Can I be bold enough to say this morning that if all Americans who call themselves Christians would speak up and have a voice for Christ, we wouldn't be in the mess we are in? Would that be fair enough to say? If all the Christ followers would be just be a voice, then we probably wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. There needs to be some kind of action out of our belief in Christ. I once heard a guy say that being on your knees is to be followed by getting on your feet. We can't pray for things that we're not willing to get involved with. Well, that's pretty strong, isn't it? We can't pray for things we're not willing to get involved with. Oh, we could pray for it, but that's not the heart of the Father. We've got to get involved. 
one of the things we talked about as we we shared, we discussed, and so on, and sought the heart of the God uh, on uh, at our elders meeting this week, is that we felt like there needed to be that second step happen, and that is that we get up and we do something about what God's put in front of us. Again, fire insurance wasn't God's only only intent was sending Christ. Um, Otherwise, he would have just, why didn't he just whisk us off when we become Christians? If, if the whole goal was to accept Christ as, as our Savior and nothing else, then why didn't, when we come to Christ, why didn't we say, okay, we'll see you later and whisk us right off? He's much bigger plan than just saving us from hell. And as disciples of Jesus, we have a two-letter word to deal with, and that's the word go. We've got, uh, in, uh, and again, not, I'm probably giving you a real familiar verse. Jesus said to them, all powers have been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make followers of all nations, baptizing them, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do all things I have told you, and I am with you always, even in the end of the earth. Now look at all the action words there. All the verbs, the action words. And it says go. It says make. It says baptize. It says teach. I mean, that's a lot of doing, isn't it? You see, there's something out of that comes out of our time with the one thing that's our heart, that's our purpose to carry, and that is to go, to go. Jesus spoke these words to the disciples after his resurrection right before he went back into heaven. And, and, and these were his last words. He spoke them. I mean, basically, I mean, wouldn't you think the last words would probably be some of the most important words to Christ? Well, one of the last words was go, go, go out there, be a voice. Be, be, be my witnesses. Be a voice. We often miss the get, the get going part in our relationship with Christ. I don't think it mean. I don't think it has to. I think we make it too difficult. The go part. We just need to be a voice. Whatever place we're in. When you talk about the go, how many, how many of us automatically start to get all nervous and so on and say, you're asking me to go preach on the street corner, or you're asking me to go door to door or whatever it is. No, I'm asking you, and, I'm, and I think Christ is asking us to be a voice. It's not that hard. Be a voice to your family. Be a voice where you work. Be a voice in your school. What does it mean being a voice? Does it mean standing in front of everybody talking? No. It means that when, that, when this one person you see is, 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 is marginalized, it's being a voice and speaking God's heart to that person. When you see a guy frustrated and getting picked on at work or whatever it might be, it's be a voice and encouragement of Christ. It's be a voice. Now remember John the Baptist said, he didn't say, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a voice so that I'm a voice that brings people into relationship with Christ. No, he said, I am a voice in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, if you look at that from the stat standpoint, if you are a voice the same way, and I believe that call goes to all of us, that our voice is to prepare the way for the Lord, to prepare somebody's heart to receive the gospel. Now, that makes a whole different slant on things. Because now you start to become aware of the people that don't know Christ. You start to become aware of, the, of how you can speak into their lives to open the door, to prepare the way for Christ to come. I think we make it too hard. Didn't say the voice saves them, so to speak. But the voice prepared the way. It's not only opening your mouth, it's doing something to show you follow Christ and our, our representative. Sandy um, showed me an older song, and it's, uh, it's by, remember the, remember the group Point of Grace? Remember that group? That's an old group, isn't it? I think my paper went over here. I think I left it back here. Yeah, there it is. So it's a song called All the World. And um, it says, 
All the world is a story. All the world is a stage. All the world is a canvas. All the world is a page. All the world is a horizon. All the world is a field of dreams. All the world is an open doorway. All the world is a place for me. Saying the whole world's an open door for us. That's the way I interpret it anyway. The world is a place for me. That's what our call is. We're called to go into the world. And it says, the chorus says, to be your voice, to be your touch, to give an answer to show your love, to hold out hope, to offer peace, to shine your light for everyone to see in all the world. The second chorus, or end of the, end of the second verse in the chorus says, all the world is a chance. To be your voice, to be your touch, to give an answer, to show your love. To hold out hope, to offer peace. You know, to hold out hope, you realize that being a voice means that you hold out hope to people. And today, you know, we, we, it, it just feels a little heavy today because of what's happened and what we prayed for. But we have hope. We have hope. We're not, we're not going to get discouraged. I mean, we, we might get a little discouraged with what we see. But we have ultimate hope. We're not discouraged to the point of quitting. Let's go ahead and play that. I really do. Rather than just start looking, rather than being aware of people around us. You know, there are people here that feel called to other people groups. There are people here that feel called to other countries. There are people here that feel called to different kinds of jobs that involve multicultural stuff. Maybe in, but you know what? We're all called to where we are. We're all called to be a voice. And quite possibly we could turn the wilderness place around. Psalm 107, he makes the wilderness pools of water and a thirsty land into springs of water. And that's the hope. That's what he does. That's what he does. May that provoke us to be a voice. See, to me, this is a call to action. The enemies come in like a flood. It's time the banner's been raised, the standard's been raised. It's time to be a voice. Let's pray. Father, we just want to... Uh, <clears throat> Father, I just want to thank you for the hope that we have. That we are not hopeless, but we're hope-filled. Our hearts are grieved and broken for the families and for this young man who aren't feeling that hope right now. But Father, it's not just there, it's all around us where people aren't feeling the hope and the love. Father, may we be a voice of your hope and your love. I pray that in Jesus' name.